Welcome to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to people about their stories with Feds, Marfan, Lowy Steeds, and related vascular and aortic connective tissue conditions. This is your host, Katie. And before we get into the show, I want to remind you that the views, information, and opinions in this podcast are those of the individuals involved, and the information presented does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. Any opinions that I express in this podcast are my own and not of my employer. In the last episode, we talked to Lauren Atherton about her experience with Lois Dietz syndrome. Today, we're talking to Liam Nelson about his experience with Marfan syndrome, including how he handled his diagnosis as a child, his career in film and comedy, his involvement in the Marfan community, and more. This is the last episode of this season, and I'm planning for a new season in the spring. If you or a family member have VEDS, Marfan, Lois Dietz, and want to be on the show, check out the episode show notes for a link to get on the recording schedule. Let's get into the show. Hey, Liam, thank you so much for coming on to the show to share your story with Marfan syndrome with everybody. I have seen you do comedy skits and stuff, and I know that other people in our community have too, especially if they were at conference this past year. But for those that don't know you already, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Liam Nelson. I'm a 24-year-old stand-up comedian, video producer with Marfan syndrome. Uh, I live in New York City, uh, in Harlem specifically. Uh, I'm excited to be here talking about life and times. Yeah, I'm excited that you're here too. You were diagnosed as a kid, right? I was, uh, 11 years old, yeah. How did that diagnosis come about? So it was a it was a process of a diagnosis. I had a really great pediatric doctor, Dr. Yoder. When I was five years old, he encouraged my parents to go get me checked out by a geneticist and then they looked at me and then told me that I didn't have it because of the, you know, finger counting test. I didn't quite I still don't fully understand how that all works. All I know is that watching your doctor count on their fingers is not the most comforting experience. <laughs> but um the first time there was not enough symptoms early on. And so I left thinking I didn't have Marfan syndrome, played basketball for another six years. And then when I was about to move up to middle school, my doctor again was like, can we just put him in one more time? Like just send him, like send him to the geneticist one more time. I did the g- genetic test that had been more recently developed and that plus having a lot more symptoms kind of turned the table. And I was, pretty quickly like oh no you for sure have it the the attitude was very different the second time around what kind of outward symptoms of marfan syndrome do you have seven feet tall that's a big one for sure um very tall skinny long fingers uh my arms aren't quite as long as some folks are my like super high arches my toes are all bent bent up and long uh not as much eye stuff i have like nearsightedness and astigmatism but that's pretty minor compared to some other folks that i know i I had a pectus that was pretty severe so i had to get that repaired i had to get my in towing corrected with a like tibia fibula like split surgery when i was 12 so like i've had to have some orthopedic stuff but not nothing crazy so it's like i'm pretty lucky i'd say with the bag or like the hand that i was dealt as far as marfan symptoms go yeah what did this feel like getting this diagnosis when you were a kid and what were you told about it it was tough uh it definitely put me in a dark place for a minute i mean obviously your doctor tells you a lot Uh, they can tell you i mean they tell as much as an 11 year old can understand about a disorder and they, and it's their job to tell you that you're going to be fine. So you're like, uh, you believe them as far as like, you know, you have that trust in the world that everything's good. But then, I don't know, Google definitely didn't help. Having the ability to go search for Marfan syndrome and just see endless articles about, you know, people die. Uh, oh, life expectancy is 30. And it's an article from like 1984, but I don't know that. You know, I'm 11. I'm just taking in information and freaking myself out so bad that I don't think I have any sort of future that I think I'm going to die before I'm 30. Uh, And it really put me in a dark place for a few years Uh, in middle school. I really kind of stopped trying altogether. I had to stop playing basketball. The only thing I really put any sort of like effort into was 
film at the time. So it was a, it, it kind of stripped away a lot of it. It was a weird moment with my mortality that happened a lot earlier than I think most people experienced that to where it made me really focus on like not appeasing others or like the world as a whole, but just focusing on what mattered to me in my limited time that I thought I had, you know? Yeah. So what did you want to do with film when you were that age and started putting energy into that? Yeah. I mean, so I started out making movies with my best friends in the backyard uh, and it spiraled into, you know, my parents, I think could tell that I was going through a tough time and it's, it was a tough diagnosis on everybody. So they really helped. Uh, Obviously we had some family friends who worked in the film industry. So I was able to really put some like larger productions together, producing, directing, shooting. And then I started my own video company. And so like really just like going super like professional and trying to skip like a hundred steps to just get straight to like, Oh, I'm 35 and I have a full-time job, you know, because I, at the time didn't feel like that was Mm -hmm. something that I had time to like let realize naturally. And so it kind of set up a weird trend of like, all right, now, anytime I do something that's fun, I have to then make it my career which is kind of what happened afterwards with comedy. It's like, it's a natural, like you start doing it for fun at first, but then it, that is just how I'm built because of my experience with the, with Marfan syndrome. Mm-hmm. Did you have anybody to look up to when you were a kid with Marfan syndrome? Or are you the only person in your family? Yeah, I'm, I'm rolling solo. So I did not meet another person with Marfan syndrome until I showed up at my first conference in Chicago in 2015. And I was in the elevator with like four people and I was like freaking out. <laughs> it was crazy. What did that feel like? Oh, I mean, it was, it's like, you don't think it's going to be as like healing and comforting as it is because you don't think like, oh, you know, they're, they have my same disorder. We have something in common. I have things in common with a lot of people, but like they have something in common that is so fundamental to every aspect of how we live our lives. And like, even if it's not necessarily another person with Marfan syndrome, just another person with like, VEDS, uh, any sort of connective tissue disorder, there's certain things that like fundamentally are different with how we have to go about every day that is just understood without having to mention it. And you just know that. And it's, it's, it's an energy of a space. I don't know. You just feel comforted by the presence of other people who just get it naturally, you know? Yeah, for sure. I felt that for sure. Especially at those events where there's like lots of people together and you're just en- enveloped in this. Yeah, being in a crowd space. of like 300, you know, MARFs is what I like to call us, but people with connective <laughs> tissue disorders, I, I consider, you know, VEDS people MARFs under the general umbrella term. But we, we need to think of a, a fun nickname for connective tissues as a whole. But anytime I'm in a big crowd mm-hmm. like that, it just, it feels like it's like, I don't know, the, it's a support system that is inherent to like who we are, you know, like we, I I found within the Marfan community that like, we're willing to be a lot more like there for each other and more intimate and like more personal ways because of the amount that we ask of other people. Like I spend, you know, a good 60% of my time traveling around the country doing comedy and about half the cities where I'm able to stay at someone's house. It's a random family from conference or like someone that I've met briefly or someone who I haven't even met who just like, Oh, Marfan comics coming to town. You can have our guest room. Nice to meet you. We're going to hang out with you this weekend. And now we're going to be friends and we'll see you at conference next year. You know, that is so awesome. It's just like, it's that kind of like willingness to go above and beyond because you are used to people having to go above and beyond to care for you. It's like the empathy is fun. You know, it's like being in that kind of space. I started going to conference when I was 15 and my first conference, I made friends for life, you know, uh, like Samantha, no Dominguez, uh, who works for the foundation's little sister, William and Robert case brothers, just a bunch of friends that I made that first year within literally three days of knowing these people, they were some of my best friends for the rest of my, like up until now, like they're people I consider closer to me than 85% of the people in my life who I see every day, you know? And it's this like Mm -hmm. shortcut to, to understanding and empathy that like a lot of the things that I think sometimes make it more difficult for us to fully relate with our friends and family about normal life stuff is because our normal life stuff is slightly different. 
and just being able to go to the first conference, meet these people. And then immediately my second year, my family wasn't able to send me to conference. And so they all, uh, Stephanie No paid for my hotel, Melanie Case paid for my flight. They picked me up from the airport. They drove me there, dropped me back off when it was time for me to go home. Like, like they facilitated, I was like 16 years old. I got to go oh. to conference because they, after knowing me for three days, were willing to be like, oh, nope, he's part of the family now. He has to come. Like, we're going to make sure he gets here. I don't know. That is so beautiful. Right? It just like, it was, Yeah. and I still am friends with all those people now. And it's just, I don't know, it's not a type of relationship that I've been able to replicate anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, so at 11, you were like thinking about your mortality, mm-hmm. trying to figure out how to do what you wanted to do with your life. Yeah, stop doing before. homework or school completely. Just kind of opted out of everything. <laughs> it was. Yeah, not doing had that. Had a real chip on my um, shoulder. <laughs> yeah. And then you go to this conference and you meet this amazing community of people that become family. How do you think that that has changed your life? I mean, you can see it literally just if you just look at like the numbers of my test scores, you know, just my willingness to just engage with the world again. I went from failing all my classes to getting straight A's for the rest of high school because like I had had a reason to like wow. lock back in with, I mean, not straight A's, there was some beef in there, but it was like, you know, sign- good grades for the rest of high school. And it was like enough to just have me kind of click back in with life and be like, no, you know, there's Chris Eney. He's in his sixties and he has my thing, you know? And it's like, oh, that's something that I literally told myself was impossible. Like it wasn't just like unlikely. It was impossible in my head. And just the like possibility of having a long, healthy life made me want to like optimize my life as much as possible and re-engage with every aspect of it. And just, I don't know, just participate and the, the, I was suffering from depression and it really like cleared up in a way that not a lot of types of depression I think are able to. And I think I'm very lucky that I was able to like cure aspects of how I was feeling at the time by going to this conference. You know, it was a, it was a significant change in my personality and my mental well being, just everything. I felt totally different as soon as I had been to conference for the first time. Yeah. And you mentioned Chris Heaney and he recently passed away. I heard he had an amazing impact on the Mar fan community and only briefly got to meet him. I'm so sorry for that loss. Yeah. No, he's a, he's an incredible guy. Shout out to Chris Heaney and his family. He's, uh, yeah. One of, one of those people that you look to kind of the, the, the flagship for all of us a little bit, just someone who's been like so great and so like capable and so, prolific for so long in the community that we can all just look to as like the person who's like, Oh, well I'm going to be fine. Cause Chris is fine. You know? Mm-hmm. So yeah. tough to lose that, but yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, when did you start getting involved in the team program or the camps? I think you're more involved in the camps, right? Yeah. So, well, so I was involved in the team program initially pretty heavily by my first year, right after conference, I was, added to the teen council, which was definitely helped me kind of get more integrated. I got to meet a bunch of people who hadn't made it to conference that year, who lived all around the country and got to plan the conference for next year and pick the field trip and all that, which was great. It's like to engage with everything and feel like I was a part of it. So that was like, I got to start speaking about my experience with Marfan syndrome to like parent Q and a panels. They would have like the teen and I, I think they still do it. They have the teen council come, answer questions for parents just to get kind of a, a younger person's perspective on how their kids might be feeling. Uh, and I think that really like resonated with me and I really enjoyed that. So I started working on a documentary when I was in the hospital, when I was uh, 17 after having a pectus repair surgery about people with Marfan syndrome and trying to just like take the stories that had like helped me in such a prolific way and put them into something digital that could be consumed outside of, you know, being able to fly all the way to wherever conferences that year and meet these people in person to be able to just like put just even an, a fraction of that comfort into something that could be sent out overseas. And I, there have been like parts of it that have been completed, but it was just, it was a long process of basically me driving around the country when I was 17 between conferences and just staying with people, interviewing them for days and then just trying to find out what kind of story I wanted to tell of all the people who inspired me the most to like 
continue living my life, mm-hmm. which, you know, was tough and it still is tough. I'm, I'm like 70% of the way through it now, like five years later, just because it's like, it's uh, people's lives change so much year to year. Like Chris's whole situation was different from the first time I interviewed him in Austin to the, the last time I interviewed him in Raleigh. But so I, I kind of focused on that project for a, a while and that helped me engage with the foundation a little bit more. They started, you know, putting me to go speak at like a new hospital opening or that kind of thing, uh, getting to go mm-hmm. be a, a, a person who's like seen by the community as someone who can like speak on their experience. And that definitely pushed me into just being comfortable, like public speaking. I had been a magician as a kid, so it was like a, kind of a natural transition from oh, let me do a thing where I have to have a trick prepared to, oh, I just have to talk about myself and make people feel a couple of emotions at a, a few beats. Cool. And they'll donate money to either my movie or the foundation <laughs> or whatever. Like that was way easier. Oh my God, I don't have to have any sort of like concrete, like sleight of hand skills. And I still get to stand up on a stage <laughs> and have everyone look at me like, that's great. So yeah, that was like, I was doing a lot of that kind of volunteer work in a, you know, spokesperson, teenager capacity. Yeah. Yeah. And then I joined like the young adult council once I aged out of the teen program. Uh, but then since then it's kind of been, I've had to kind of focus on obviously my own life and everything, but the camp program specifically, I was actually the one who, I mean, they, they'd had a family camp for one year in Georgia, which is like a weekend long thing. Families and their kids all come stay in the cabins and you do all the fun camp activities, but in like a weekend setting, where the families are all together. And I went to that first one and I was like, this is awesome. But like, as a person with Marfan syndrome who never got to go to camp, I would love to have just like a kid's camp, like a real sleep away mm-hmm. week long summer camp. Uh, and then they ended up doing that the, the next year. And the two counselors, uh, I was the only boys counselor the first year. <laughs> it was me and I think 18 boys. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So <laughs> it was like, we were in one big log cabin building together, luckily, but it was, yeah, two different cabins worth were all mine to be in charge wow. of. And then my, my lovely girlfriend, Katie, was one of the female counselors. We were started dating six months earlier at the end of high school, and then she was already volunteering at camp and has volunteered every year since and went to conference with me that year. So, you know, the foundation, you know, once you start kind of engaging with the Marfan community or the, the connective tissue community, it, it really like sucks you in fast because it, it, it's so it's such a like yeah, right place for us to be, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I certainly feel that, too. What was the experience like with the with the kids at camp? Like, what is it like interacting with kids with? Oh, man. I mean, the first conditions? year at camp was I cried a lot that several different times throughout and I tried to you know obviously not make it too obvious in front of the kids but like I just for my own personal experience of like someone who never got to go to camp because my parents were afraid of like something happening to me which like rightfully so most outdoor summer camps are way too strenuous for someone with a disability just by nature I mean at least the ones that my parents had grown up going to and would have sent me to if they sent me anywhere, it's all like, you know, you got to walk up hill half a mile just to get to your cabin at night. And I just can't imagine having to have done that as a kid, but having this new environment where like we take that into account and just everything is built for us to succeed in. Like when I say us, it's like me and all the campers, like I got to climb a rock wall and ring the bell for the first time in my life. Uh, And that is one of the times I, I was just up there sobbing on the top of a rock wall. Just all the kids like like cheering for me <laughs> at the bottom, and I'm just like, I'll be down in a second. Like, just give me a minute. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, just like being able to see like just kids have an experience that like you never got to have of that like yeah being able to be in a place on their own with the safety net of you know obviously like Leslie who was our camp nurse the first few years. She was incredible and was she's a Sibley Heart Center specialist, nurse, nurse practitioner. So she was one of the most you know equipped people possible to be there to make sure our kids were safe. And they had us who were, you know, me, their counselor who also has Marfan syndrome. So I'm not going to be like, hey, we got to go run around in the sun for three hours because I would get tired first. You know, like I want to go inside more than any of you kids. <laughs> like we're going to go for a water break because I need one, you know. Which mm-hmm. just makes it a lot, the, the culture of the camp is just so much more supportive and like 
no one's ever like, oh, well, do we have to go get water? It's always like, oh, well, yeah, we got to go get water because like three of us are tired right now. It's, it's all very supportive. It's all like, oh, you know, we, we can't do this activity right now. Are we all feeling pretty tired? You guys want to ditch it and go do a nap? Sweet. And then we all go take a nap together. It's, it's, all, it's like just having the ability to have the highs of camp without having to go through like the hardship of it not being built to accommodate us is huge. That's amazing. And I'm so, I'm so happy that kids with these conditions have that, you know, me too. And it's, and it's like, along with it's counselors not just like, that have the conditions too. Yeah. And it's been more and more every year. Like Ashley Rose is a counselor with beds. It was awesome having her. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had another counselor with beds last year. We've had like, uh, we've started adding way more counselors who are affected and it's been awesome. Just being able to have people, you know, oh, there's a, a kid with vets who has like a question about life. Go talk to Ashley Rose for an hour and by the campfire and just talk about life. And eventually you'll kind of run across something that they need to get some advice about. You know, it's just yeah. having this environment that's built specifically for kids to like explore, you know, being independent and being able to be on their own because so many kids with disabilities are never allowed to be freestanding, which really stunts the rest of their lives, you know, like there's so many kids who I have mm-hmm. met at camp who would not have been like functional, like independent adults who don't, who aren't codependent on someone else to provide for them only f- because they just never learned how to do stuff for themselves. And so at that camp, like yeah. we just give them a week of like, Oh, you know, you're safe, but like, we're going to take a few risks. You know, we're going to climb a rock wall. We're going to go on a little a, a zip line. We're going to go on a giant swing. We're going to go in a canoe. We're going to all these things that like 80% of them have not done ever. And their parents would be mortified if they were there watching them do it, but their parents aren't there watching them do it. Their friends and counselors who have the same thing are watching them do it and know what all we can and can do. And we never have to have that moment of like, oh, Johnny, be, are you, be okay. Are you okay out there? Like the panic that comes with a lot of mm-hmm. parents of disabled children, especially those who are unaffected, just trying to like put the right type of care on their kid. And like, I, obviously I'm not like, I love, I appreciate all the love and support that every type of parent gives kids with disabilities, but there's a certain type of understanding that just really helps kids get out of their shell and be the best versions of themselves in front of their community and i think that comes out at camp in spades you know yeah that is so wonderful you make me want to be a, a camp you counselor. Should. it's fun <laughs> it's a good time <laughs> it's only a week too so yeah, it's like I have, it's the most uh, exhausting week it. of your life but it is very fun yeah it sounds beautiful yeah it's great and it then really sometimes does. if the kids are good you get <laughs> this year i got i don't know how i got both but i got ice bucketed and whipped cream pied in the face as their prize. So they like multiple cabins spent all of their money <laughs> to just get me. Like they, they had their own counselors too, but yeah. Um, but it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> that could be you. Could That's be awesome. you, Katie. Come on. <laughs> I'll take the whipped cream to the face. I'm not sure about the ice <laughs> bucket. <pretty> <laughs> Is it, yeah. it is Georgia. I got rain summer, though, and so I can the, just the imagine. The ice is kind of nice, you know? It's pretty toasty out there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, I know you had, you mentioned that you had a pectus surgery yes. when you were 17. Mm-hmm. Is that right? I think so, yeah, 17. And then um, you've had some other surgeries too. Do you want to talk about those? Yeah. So the list goes, I had a, uh, I, I don't know the doctor name of this one, but the in towing repair where I had, uh, I, I walked with my feet turned in pretty severely. So they cut my tibia and fibula on both legs and rotated them. So I was in like leg casts for a couple months out of school completely, like mm-hmm. cast from like toe to mid thigh. And then it still didn't fully take, which is cool <laughs> to know now that all that was for <laughs> barely anything. But then I had a knee surgery, I guess actually the year before I'd had a knee surgery because my knees also turned in uh, all very classic, like Marfan features. Mine were just so much that they were getting like bruised when I would walk. And that also, you know, they put plates in there. That was a lot less invasive. They took the plates out whenever they went in to do my legs. 
but that also didn't fully take because they took the place out too early. They're like, oh, he'll stop growing. And I just didn't. And then mm. had a package repair when I was 17. That was probably the biggest one. Obviously, opening your chest is a, a big deal. And that one went mm-hmm. pretty well. It was definitely less physically intensive of a recovery than the others, just because it was less like, you know, bones being sawed and that kind of stuff. But uh, it was a lot more emotionally tolling for me because I was in the hospital for a lot longer. Also, some personal stuff happened while I was in the hospital at that time, which was really unfortunate. And so that was definitely like a, I don't know, the, that's my last like major surgery that I've had. And it was not the best time. So I'm not super excited to go back under the knife again, which I think is like a, a natural yeah. thing. It's like, oh, last time I went on a hot air balloon ride, the hot air balloon had a hole in it and it was scary. You know, so like, I don't want to go on a hot air balloon ride again, but not everyone has to go on hot air balloon rides for the rest of their life. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a bummer, right. but it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting way that it's turned. I mean, obviously I don't think anyone loves surgery, but there was a time after I got my leg surgery, after I had broken like three hospital records for recovery time where I was like, you know what? I kind of dig it. I, I like this. I like this being the best at healing from surgery thing. And so I was really like, weirdly gung-ho about the surgeries also because i you know you, when you're very young you don't ever have that voice in the back of your head that's the scary one that's telling you stuff it's just the one that's like oh i'm gonna fix my knees or oh i'm gonna fix my legs mm-hmm. and so just like the difference between then and my like after the the most recent surgery was definitely like you really feel yourself getting older as you go through traumatic things like that and how differently they impact you. Like before, it's like, oh, I don't have to go to school for two months. Versus now, if I had to be out of commission for two months, it's like, how am I going to survive? Like, am I going to make, how will I make rent, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Did they, did I remember correctly that they repaired your aortic root while they did that surgery? Uh, No. So they were talking about doing it at the same time, but they ended up just doing that. But they said that they would use elements of that surgery to like go back in through the same way whenever it is time to do that. They said right now my aortic root is fine, uh, but they would have to go in and repair it probably within like 15 ish years. Okay. I mean, that's like, you know, yeah, hopefully I, a 15 years. pretty good. I had, I've had like two or three friends who've already had to get a repair before they're, you know, 23. So it's, yeah, very lu- once again, very lucky yeah. with how I'm like physically impacted by all this. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. That's really fantastic. That that sense of like as you're you you mentioned like feeling older. Yeah. Right? Like you have these surgeries and then you feel older. There, there are days like I'm 24, but there are days where it just really doesn't feel like that you know it's like i got some 62 year old 82 year old i got some 95 year old days sometimes it's when my hip is out i'm like mm-hmm. oh man can you give me something from the kitchen like it's the whole different version of myself that comes out yeah I, i'm only laughing because it's so relatable yeah. <laughs> like, from the vets experience it's very relatable i feel like i've got a lot of uh older days yeah in me too um what, I mean, some of the other things that you said in this interview were like this, the day, like understanding the frustrations day to day and kind of, maybe it was when we were talking earlier, but just the the things that we have to deal with with these conditions on a day-to-day basis mm-hmm. that people who don't have the conditions as, like they can't fully understand it as well as somebody with the condition. Yeah. Uh, what are some of those things? I mean, I think it's the little things I think are the most impactful for like when you tell people, like, I think it's the, Oh, I can't, I got to check this roller coaster speed before I go on it. Like people are like, Oh, mm-hmm. weird. Okay. Or like, you know, and I, I'm still taking a lot more risks than a lot of people will with the uh, conditions, but like, trying to think of good concrete examples. Like it's little things like, Oh, I can't go to the grocery store today. I was planning on it, but I can't. Sorry. Because my hip hurts too bad to get up out of bed. And it's like a normal person would be like, Oh, 
well, I get your hip hurts, but can you just go? It's across the street. Like, can you go downstairs? You're 24. Can you get up and like get, you know, get some crutches and go across? It's like, no, you can't make it work in certain ways. You know, there's little things that some people can do when they don't have a connective tissue disorder that they can just bounce back from. Like if I fall down, that might be the day for me. Like most people, if Mm -hmm. they trip, that's like, oh, oops, embarrassing. Let me get back up. If I trip and I hit my leg in a bad way, I'm not able to walk normal for several weeks usually. Mm -hmm. So just like the little, you know, oopsies that translate into much bigger oopsies over time that just don't, don't for normal people or normal, but for people, unaffected people. um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find that very relatable. And it's the, um, I like, I like that you phrased it as oopsies. Well, cause like, you know, it's like, we're allowed to fall down. Like as people like, Oh no, oops, I tripped. Like, (laughs) Oh no, I tripped. And now I can't go to work for a week. You know, it's like, it's so much more consequences (laughs) to our little oopsies. Yes. Yes. I really like that analogy (laughs) so much because it's so true. Yeah, it's so true. It could be just a little thing. And it's just like, oh, like, I, I remember when I it doesn't matter. I mean, I tripped down the stairs mm-hmm. a couple of years ago and ruptured an artery, oh, you know? Yeah. And it was like a hey, big deal. Yeah, right. Like, oh, <laughs> well, yeah, I was uh, going to get well, I discovered I had pots because I took a shower and ate a steak and then passed out walking down a hallway, just like fully from standing to black instantly. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was just that's scary, right? It's just like yeah. little things that all of a sudden you're like, oh, what? Hold on, I'm, I'm whoa, got to <laughs> hold on a minute. Just take stock of like yourself <laughs> and your life, because like there, you know, I mm-hmm. want to feel like I'm 24 for moments of my day. That would be nice, but then yeah. you can't fully. I I can't sit down in a place for too long. I can't like in school. I think was definitely the most egregious feeling different I've ever felt was sitting in like tiny chairs all day. And I would just be like doing yoga in my chair the whole day, trying to just like move in a way that was at all comfortable for me to sit. Uh, And that's just like sitting in a chair, which is like baseline people behavior. Like I remember when I was a kid getting reprimanded for not sitting crisscross applesauce the right way. And I'm like, I can't. My knees feel like they're about to pop out of joint right now. Like, I, please don't make me do that. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't, I couldn't articulate that when I was younger. And I, I think right. that goes with the older thing. It's like, I think I always had weird little things that m- made me feel different than others. But I, I was much younger. So, like, when you're a kid, you're made of rubber to an extent. Like you have a lot more, you know, recoverability than when you're older and also i was just not like i didn't understand that i didn't have to just be in trouble all the time for like i got an s in handwriting every year and i'm like now i'm like what i had a connective tissue disorder my hands felt like they were gonna fall apart when i was writing long essays like of course my handwriting's bad because i can write well for like two sentences and my hand feels like it's like it's gonna fall off like uh, please don't make me write five page essays when i can just type it instead you know there, there's ways to like subvert a lot of yeah. the more like glaring differences between our lives and like a, an unaffected person's lives but your whole life is just you learning new tools to like advocate for yourself to get those accommodations yeah. made you know yeah totally when I, I know that you bring a lot of this into your comedy skits, mm-hmm. when did you get into comedy? So I started doing stand up comedy when I was 19, uh, like October 2019. So I guess I just turned 20. It was, you know, I was at home during the pandemic, didn't really have any friends. They had all gone off to like college that year, and I decided to stay home and work full time doing production, which was nice, but it wasn't like social. So I initially just started filming for local comedians because I just wanted a new, I had always loved comedy and I wanted just a new group of friends to hang out with. Uh, And then eventually I would just talk about doing comedy so much that one of them got annoyed and put my name in the random draw bucket at a show. 
and I did my first set, did five minutes. It was, you know, I, I got it recorded. Not great, but it's better than someone who shouldn't do comedy ever, I guess. And I, it just kind of hooked me <laughs> initially. Uh, just like, I mean, so the first thing I said on stage is still the first thing I say on stage. You walk up and you say seven feet and we all shut up about it now. And it killed. So like the first thing I ever said on stage did well. And so I think from then on, it was like, all right. And it was a slow transition from like, oh, I, I like comedy, but I'm not going to do it full time to, oh no, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. Like, this is my main thing. Video is just a tool to help facilitate the comedy, you know? Yeah. Um, What does it feel like bringing your experience with Marfan into the comedy world? It's been really cool. That's honestly been one of my favorite parts about touring the country is one, like I mentioned earlier, being able to just like stay with my community and like rely on my community for resources like that. Also, like every person I draw out to a show in, you know, I drew three people in Fayetteville, West Virginia, because one of them had Marfan syndrome and they drove four hours mm-hmm. to come see me. Wow. Like that's uh, like people with Marfan and related conditions. Like I've had some people, uh, I had some people with VEDS drive out like two and a half hours to Liberty Township, Ohio. I had like everyone who like comes out at this level of my career, like I'm just starting to headline, which is, you know, you're still building that following. But like the first members of that following are all people from the community who've just seen my stuff online. And all of my most successful clips are because of the community engaging with them and like sharing them around. So it's been, it's, I mean, it's been huge. I feel like having Marfan syndrome has done more f- for my comedy career than anything, but like, it's because that's what I have. That's worth talking about. You know, like I, that's what I have. That's worth that resonates with people. My favorite thing is like, I have a joke. I, I did. I think I did it at a conference about being hypermobile. And that has been a new one where like, I think I've probably gotten half a dozen people at this point diagnosed with hypermobile Ehlers, Ehlers Danlos because they can do like my level stuff or crazier with their hands and they go talk to their doctor and two months later they master me like hey I have Ehlers Danlos syndrome thank you for like telling me about that so it's, it's just like wow. yeah. you get the people who are finding out about it you get the people who come up to you legitimately curious about it afterwards who like I've given away probably 150 foundation bracelets for just like info for people and just mm-hmm. like but also having the people who live with it come out and just seeing them in the crowd like i had a show in new york i did and there was this uh it was a packed out show like 100 people in a basement uh and you know obviously i barely fit in the venue uh and i i, have a thing, I was like oh i have a thing called marfan syndrome and a guy like cheers and i i'm like oh you didn't you know what marfan syndrome is and he's like oh i have that and then for the rest of the show, I'm just like kind of staring at his face and he is laughing harder <laughs> than the entire rest of the audience put together. Cause I just, anytime that happens where like someone identifies themselves that they have Marfan syndrome or any sort of related disorder, I will then proceed to do the rest of my set as all like connective tissue material. So it's been, it's, it's, it's great. It's like super rewarding because it's, you know, I, I had a kid at camp come up and quote one of my jokes to me. And that was probably the coolest thing that's ever happened. You know, it's like, I, that's because it was one of them where it's like, oh, it's it, my one where I explain, you know, what having a connective tissue disorder, what Marfan syndrome is by comparing us to like off brand AirPods. Like a kid came up and just said, like, oh, I've been telling all my friends that. And they all kind of get it now. <laughs> and just like, it's like, it's, it's cool. You know, it's, it's cool that I'm like, especially with stand up and the writing element of that, like, I'm just helping arm these future versions of me with these tools to like have a easier time explaining their thing, you know, or like an easier time understanding yes. their thing in the context of like another person who's on a stage talking to 300 people right now, you know? Yeah. That is so cool. Yeah. That is so, so it's cool. It's been really fun. I'm really excited. I- I'm planning on doing a, I don't want to make it super public yet, but I'm, I'm doing actually, this is uh, coming out end of December, right? Yep. Then I will have just done a taping for Sirius XM, which will be almost completely connective tissue material, which hopefully will make its way onto the platform. So you can hopefully catch me there uh, in the very near future from this recording. That would be awesome. Where do we, where would we look for that? 
Uh, so Sirius XM. So they, uh, any of the comedy channels on there would be picking up okay. my 12 minutes and just kind of picking whichever clips each one of them likes. So just keep a, keep an ear out for. Oh, heck yeah. For that's some so jokes awesome. you might recognize on there. Uh, but yeah, yes. so I, that's, that's my, my big thing is just trying to like condense it all into one thing to put out to the community. So I'm going to release that also as like a 12 minute long special and put it in all the Facebook groups and all the foundation pages and everything just so like people can kind of have access to it and not have to come out and see me necessarily. Oh, but I think we will. I mean, I speak for myself yeah. and probably some people in the community when I say we're going to still come and oh, see Oh, please you. do. I mean, keep in mind, that's only 10 <laughs> minutes. You know? I would think. <laughs> I, got, I got a whole hour's worth of stuff that's fun yeah. to talk about. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's been great. No, it's awesome. So you mentioned the, you know, having, for kids having the tools yeah. to understand themselves and explain themselves and everything. What kind of advice do you have for kids with these conditions? Um, I think talk to your friends about the thing that you have share as much as you feel comfortable sharing, but I will say you'd be surprised at how well they will take it. Like I remember when I was a kid or in high school and I first told my, like some of them or like one of them was like a, a pretty athletic guy about my condition. And then it kind of, you know, it, it helped evolve our friendship in a way where like he was, just aware of my limitations and was like, became my advocate, just, you know, be, be willing to take someone you trust and help them have the same tools or help give them the same information that you have about yourself. So they can also advocate for you because you don't have to be the only one mm -hmm. who knows what you need. You can tell everyone around you who loves you, especially your parents, especially your teachers that like, this is what I need. And then get four or five of your friends who also know this. And if the gym coach is like, no, no, you got to run the mile. They come up and like, no, no, this is what he needs. You know, like having people to stand behind you and be like, nope, we're also aware that he has a plan. You know, like just tell all your friends about as much as you're comfortable sharing with that, because they can be the most important support system when you're not around your family, you know? So you don't have to carry it alone. I wish I had done that earlier because like in elementary school, I was uncomfortable talking about it. And so I just would only talk. I would just be sitting out of the mile run and everyone was like, oh, he's weird. Like, that's weird. If you just explain what it is and they know exactly why. And then it's it's not a weird thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. And what do you want medical professionals to know about either the lived experience with Marfan, what you want for the future with it, or what you just wish they would know? I mean, I think it's, being willing to hear us out, like being willing to have an open mind and know that like all of these conditions are still pretty new and we don't know everything that, that's associated with them. And we don't know, you know, all of the symptoms that are probably like, just be willing to, I, when I had a really tough time when I was transitioning from pediatric to adult care, because Emory had made a Marfan clinic a year after I left my primary care Marfan clinic. So I was kind of in the, the mm -hmm. ether for a year. Uh, and I went to two different general practice doctors who both tried to undiagnose me with Marfan syndrome because I didn't have all of the symptoms. And I had to show one of them a picture of me on a foundation pamphlet for them to be like, oh, okay, you have Marfan syndrome. <laughs> like, it's like, here's me on the poster. <laughs> I am literally the poster child. So just, I don't know, being willing to just hear out the experience of your patients a little bit and just... Uh, not having such hard line ideas of what our experience is based on only the medical knowledge. Like don't base your entire interpretation of our life experience off of the affliction that we have based on like the symptoms plus our personality. Plus, Just like know your patients as well as you can. And I think that's one thing that the community is rich with is uh, incredible doctors who have engaged in a way that, is meaningful with their patients and, and can really help change the course of their patient's life. So just more, more doctors like Dr. Liang and people like that, Dr. Iannucci. Yeah, for sure. You know, that has been mentioned as advice for, I think other people have mentioned that too. And it's just so, so important. The ability to, you know, not only just, you know, know your patient and listen to your patient, but also to take the medical knowledge 
I love that you mentioned that because it's constantly evolving and growing. And as research grows, we learn learn new things. Yeah. And just because something isn't validated yet in the research doesn't mean that it's not really happening. Right? Like I have a bunch of friends who all have similar GI issues. And like we don't know anything that's officially tied to it. But like we've all been talking just as friends. Like, hey, it's weird that we all have this same thing, mm-hmm. but also this same thing. Right. And uh, like we've all talked to our individual doctors about it and they've all been like, hmm. Well, we'll keep that. We'll keep an eye on that and see if that's related. Like, that's the kind of approach that you're looking for. You know, it's like, exactly. the, oh, interesting. Well, we'll write that down. We'll take you seriously and we'll, you know, keep an eye on it. And For sure. It's important for research to continue to grow and not stay stagnant. Yeah. So where can people find exactly. you? I know you're going on tour real soon or you're already on tour now at the time of recording this. But yeah, uh, John Marco Cerezi has me on the road with him. Uh a good chunk of the year. I'm going to be all over the West Coast early next year, but December, uh, I'll be headlining just north of Atlanta towards the end of the month, the 22nd or 23rd, I'm not sure yet, at a place called Alley Stage. Uh, so give me a follow on Instagram at Liam J. Nelson uh, or Facebook, Liam Nelson Comedy. And I post about all of my dates on there. Also, my website, Liam Nelson Comedy, has all my ticket links for upcoming shows. But yeah, next year I'll be all over the West Coast, up in California. Sacramento, I'll be back in Chicago, I'll be in Tampa, I'll be in Tacoma, Seattle, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, all over. So take a, take a look at my website, Liam Nelson Comedy, uh, and you'll, you'll see all my upcoming shows on there. Awesome. And I will link that in the episode show notes, and I will be getting a ticket to your Seattle show for sure. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Thanks for listening to this episode featuring Liam Nelson sharing his story with Marfan Syndrome. I've put a link for Liam's website in the episode show notes, and if you're ready to meet others, get involved, or need support, there are more links for you there too. There's also a link in the episode show notes for the VEDS Collaborative Natural History Study, a research study led by Dr. Shireen Shalhoub, open to people with VEDS, Marfan, Lois Dietz, and similar connective tissue conditions. If you like the show, be sure to share it on social media or give it a rating or review. You can also support the production of this podcast by joining my Patreon. As always, my top tier patrons are listed in the episode show notes. Thanks so much, and I will see you in the spring.